Hey guys, welcome back to the Bodie Tree Surfboards YouTube channel. Today we're going to be looking at uh, Jono's board in the next step, which is putting the frame onto the bottom deck. Um, first thing we're going to do is clean up the frame itself. Then I'm going to sand the decks. Uh, we're going to cut out the shape and then I'll show you how to lay out the rocker table. Um, or basically the way we're going to set up the rocker table. And then we'll go through rocker and how that works. Um, and then we'll glue it on. Uh, we'll see what else comes out. The last time we were in, um, we put the decks together. We clamped them up all the way to all the rest of it. But what we did was use two different glues. So we used a PVA glue and a polyurethane glue. Um, so you can see the difference, this is the internal, internal side of the board, so this is the side of the deck that was face down on the table. Uh, this is the PVA or Aquadia glue, and you can see that there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of glue there, there's not a lot of residue. We'll still have to give it a sand, um, but that's what that looks like. And the other glue that we used was the polyurethane. So the polyurethane glue expands, so that's going to fill up into, into any of the gaps. There's no real difference in the strength between the two. The difference, John, I was asking me this before, is, is what's the difference and why do we use it? I like to use a polyurethane glue because we can use it for every single stage of the board. So we can glue the decks up with it, we can glue the frame up with it. We can glue the deck to the frame, put all the bracing in, top deck and rails, all with the same glue. That should be it. So I'm going to give this a sand, um, and the reason that we want to do that is that we want to give it a mechanical key. So a mechanical key is basically just a scratch. We want to know that the glue is going to stick. Um, so I'm going to give that a sand, and while I'm doing that, John is going to clean up the frame. So we'll step you through how to do that, and then make a bit of noise. Sweet. So what we've got here is Jono's frame. Uh, it's still a little bit wobbly but it's a lot stronger than it was. Um, and as Jono said when he came in it looks a lot straighter. It's, it doesn't have the twist in it. Because it's a plywood there is going to be differences in the timber when it's laser cut. Um, but what we do when we set it up on the table is to, to straighten that stringer, get out any twists and then glue it up again with the polyurethane glue. Um, what I'm going to get Jono to do now is to actually clean up the bottom. And again, what we're doing is trying to create a mechanical key. So what we're going to use is a rasp file. The thing that I recommend is that whatever part is being worked on gets put to the edge of the table. Yeah? You don't want to put too much pressure downward on the frame. So you don't want to be pushing it down like that and stressing it out. If there's any weaknesses in the ply, you don't, you don't want to find those. Um, so basically a mechanical key. And the way we're going to do that, this doesn't need to be neat. It just needs to be flush. So I'm just about to sand the deck or the internal side of the deck so we can get it ready to put on the frame. Um, so I'm using the Merca sander. These guys are the world leader in dustless sanding technology and they use these, these nets. Um, so basically it's a super high powered vacuum and just sucks all the dust through. Uh, but we will use PPE. So what I'm going to do is just do a mechanical key. I'm going to go over the top. It doesn't need to be flushed back to perfect but it does need to be um, to have that mechanical key or the scratch in it. So the reason is, is that if anything's glossy, you can almost guarantee that anything that's super glossy isn't going to stick. It doesn't matter what sort of random orbital sander you use, you basically, they say that the best action is a figure eight, so you can go in figure eights. The most important thing with a random orbital sander is don't use it like an angle grinder. You don't want to put it on the edge, otherwise you'll stuff up your base plate. You can put pressure on different sides of the sander and that will make a big difference. So if you know you're going to sand through here, you can just put a bit of pressure on there. But don't use it like an angle grinder, otherwise it will stuff up your tools. Um, I'm going to do half of this and Jono's going to do the other half. And then we'll cut it out and glue it on. Okay, so the next thing you want to do, Jono, is basically look at how your frame is going to overlay on top of the deck. 
So now that it's sanded, we've given it a brush off. It's nice and flat, it's not perfect and it doesn't need to be. You don't want to take off more material than you need to. Um, now when you laid the deck planks out, we made sure that it was wide enough and long enough. So all you really want to do is make sure that everything's sitting in place, that it's the right length of nose to tail. We're going to put a weight on the top, a couple of weights on top. Once that string is lined up, what's that useful? The weight. Yeah. The weight's just there so it doesn't move around too much. So that'll stabilise through the middle because what we're going to do is just use a pen to mark the outline. So when you do the outline shape, again, you don't want to put too much pressure on the frame at any stage through the build. So you don't want to push the frame to the deck. You actually want to lift the deck up to the frame. Yeah. And with your pen, just rest it against the skirt of the board and give yourself 10 to 15 mil all the way around. What you want to make sure you don't do is move the frame around. Yeah. So you want to make sure that the the spine is, is on the stringer of your deck. And then give yourself that 10, 15 mil all the way around. And then we'll cut that out with a jigsaw. Oh, jigsaws. And so when people come into the workshop, they give everybody the exact same instructions um, just to ensure that everything happens in the right way. When we use the jigsaw, the most important thing with the jigsaw is that the base plate is flush against the deck. Um, that's probably actually not the most important thing. The most important thing is that where the line that you're cutting is not too far from the edge. If the line you're cutting is too far from the table, what can happen is if you put too much pressure on it, you'll actually crack it through the ground not the glue joint, so yep. the glue joint will always be stronger than the grain. But you want to make sure that the line you're cutting is close to the edge of the table. Your deck is more important than the table, so I don't care if you hit the table, it's most important that you don't bust your board. Yep. So always move the job around, and don't worry about the table. Um, when you use the jigsaw, I say that a, a fast moving blade and a slow movement a fast moving blade and a slow movement gives a clean cut. Yep. Um, basically you're feeding the blade. If you try and force feed the blade, it'll choke and you'll start to get chicken. So if you move nice and steady, you don't need to go super slow because all of this is excess anyway. So that 10-15 mil from the rail edge or the skirt edge is all going to be trimmed off later, but we need it to make sure we can so I'll just cut this little bit off here and then I'll leave you to it. We'll cut out both deck shapes, but we're going to put the bottom deck on today. That's good. That's good. So we're going to set up the table to um, basically correct the rocker. We'll put the rocker into the board and glue the bottom deck onto the frame. I didn't have any woodworking skills when I got home. My first workbench was two wheelie bins. So the whole process has been built around getting things off the side of the road and being able to use things that you've got around the house. So I don't use a rocker table and I, I don't do that for a lot of reasons. There's no such thing as a perfect rocker and there's no such thing as an all round board. So to me, I give people the opportunity to set their own rocker for their board. If they know where they're going to surf, we can actually tune a board for that. And what we're going to use to set up this table basically paint tins. So we've got two 10 litre paint tins and we're going to use two 4 litre paint tins for the centre of the board. And where these want to be placed, uh, most importantly is the nose and the tail because it actually wants to be right on the tip of the tin. Now the reason for that is that if you have the tin set further in, you could actually invert the rocker. If you invert the rocker, you're going to create a, a cavity underneath the board and that could actually create suction into the wave and not a good suction like a concave, but a bad suction like a suction cut. So, that's all the way to the end. 
put that frame on top and just make sure everything fits. And then I'm just going to put some support underneath, just using bits of wood. So everything you should be able to find around the house. If you check out Mike Horton 360 on Instagram, he does TED surfboards. Um, he uses the Bodhi Tree surfboards frames and he's up to his seventh or eighth board at home that he builds on his pool table. He uses surf mag mags, so he knows how to set his rocker by how many surf mags he puts underneath. And he builds, builds boards for his mates and friends and stuff like that. So check out uh, Ted Surfboards. So at the moment, this is just a supporter. We're not gonna set the rocker yet. Um, I'll go through the rocker setup with Jono, but I just wanted to show you how to do the table. So you know you don't need any fancy equipment. You don't need to create a rocker table and make every single board exactly the same. So what we'll do next is I'll set out the clamps and then I'll go through the rocker setup with Jono and talk to you a little bit more. So we've got the table set up, we've got tins on either end, we've got a couple of tins in the middle, we've got some timber underneath just supporting that and the frame sitting on top. Uh, what I'll do is just give you a quick explanation of how a board works rocker wise and then I'll, I'll go through the setup of Jono's board for how he wants it. Um, so the, the general principle of a board is that the longer the board is, the more, sorry, the longer the board is, the faster you can paddle it, is probably the best way to explain it. So if you imagine back when the Polynesians were surfing, they had 16 foot logs, and basically they were paddling, paddling those and actually matching the speed of the swell. So they're not catching breaking waves, they're not really catching forming waves, they're catching swell bubbles. So that swell bubble's moving along, they're matching the pace, the swell's behind them, they move their weight forward and the swell bubble will actually catch the board and then it's a, a weight distribution thing that if you can carry yourself on the board. So the longer a board is, the easier it is to paddle fast and to match the speed of the swell. The shorter the board becomes, the more the wave will actually have to form. So obviously these days with a modern shortboard, you're rarely paddling, you're basically turning and popping and dropping in as the wave's forming and pitching and then cutting into it. With a long board, you don't. You sit out the back, you predict the waves, you're better on a point or a reef so you know the formation. You see it coming, you paddle your guts out, you get onto it before it starts to peel, trim the wave, and then the wave will actually break over the tail of the board and help you to manoeuvre. And then that hence why you can trim from the front because you're just trimming up and down the face. So the thing that will help you to do that is the rocker. So on a board you have three major rockers. You've got a tail rocker, a centre rocker, and a nose rocker. This is your takeoff rocker, this is your paddling rocker, and this is your turning rocker. The longer and flatter this midsection is, the faster the board will paddle. Um, the more pronounced the tail rocker is, the more dynamic you have to be in your movement to actually get the board to move, but it will be a more dynamic movement, which is a high performance long board. The more nose rocker you've got, the more ability you've got to adhere to the trough of the wave so the later you can take off. On a modern longboard you might find that there's a lot of nose kick, so you can take off later, drop into the trough, the nose shape will adhere and then you can trim up into the face. With a traditional longboard they're super super flat. And the reason they're flat is that you're catching swell, you're trimming and then it's peeling. You get a little bit of suction over the back of the tail and then you can walk forward. If there's a lot of nose rocker, there's no way you'll ever hang five or hang ten because you'll actually tip the board out of the water, lose all your traction, it'll come out of that suction and you'll probably do a helicopter or something like that. 
So what we're going to do is tune this board for Jono. Um, now the way that we do that, and again we're not using a rocker table because there's no such thing as a standard board, there's no such thing as a standard rocker. My only suggestion is you go and get a board shaped by a person, not a computer, so they can actually talk to you about where you surf, how you surf, how you want to surf, and they will make a board for you. If you think you know more than a shaper, go buy a pop-out from China that's terrible for the planet. Okay. What I'm going to do is just use a couple of weights and show John how this rocket can change. Okay. So we can stretch this midsection out just by placing weights on the board. So you can see how that's pretty pronounced at the moment. I'm going to wrap one down here just to keep that tail in place. But what you'll see from here is that I'm going to stretch this out through the middle and create a little bit more forward kick in the nose. So Jono's going to be surfing in Perth and Perth is notoriously shit. So there'll always be a late takeoff here and there. There's not a lot of point breaks, not a huge amount of reef breaks, more beach breaks and very poor sand movement because the coast is so straight. So what I'm looking at when I look underneath is how flat this is. What we don't want is for the rocker to invert. If you invert the rocker again, it's gonna create suction. You're not gonna get a lot of paddling power. The other thing is you don't want too much nose kick. If there's too much nose kick, it will be very sympathetic on takeoff, but what will happen is you'll start to bulldoze water. When you bulldoze water, it's actually gonna slow down your paddling. Good for, if you remember the old Greg Weber, Mike Ramelzi boards, which was the banana board. He was the only one that could surf it, and that was basically taking off inside a pit. Um, but for, for the average person, Nice consistent rocker, not too much tail kick, not too much nose kick, but enough there to be sympathetic. It doesn't look too bad as it is, do you know? We actually should have put the clamps on before we did that. Definitely keep that in. <laughs> So we'll leave it as it is for now, we'll put the clamps on and then we'll retune the rocker um, just before Jono is ready to glue it up. Okay, so what we're going to do is start clamping the board down. So we're going to clamp down on the skirt onto the, the deck itself, but what we want to do is make sure that it's in the right spot. Now because the board is computer designed, um, we, we assume that it's, it's basically symmetrical and that the center line is straight and that we've cut this center line of the deck straight. So the best way to line it up is to actually line up the crosshair of a rib. So I always start from the middle and then work forwards and backwards. Underneath each rib is the exact same size clamp and that's for weight and balance. And we're going to start uh, by clamping the centre rib and then we'll move outwards and we'll just make sure that it's in alignment the whole way along. Okay, so we've uh, lined up this crosshair in the middle, stringer to stringer. We've put a clamp on this side, I've just moved to the other side and we're going to put this one on. So with the clamp, when you put it on, you want it, you want it basically on top of each other. You can put the clamps on like this, but really we want that pressure to be straight up and down. The way I do it is the back of the foot on the clamp will sit right on the edge of the skirt over the top of the rib. So you want that central, all the pressure pushing down. Now each time that we touch the board, we can actually move this around. So you want to check from eye line. I don't know if you can move that camera up, Jono. The only way I've ever found to do it correctly is to get right down to eye line. If you look over the top, it will look straight, but if you look down here, you want to make sure that your crosshairs are lined up. Don't worry too much if there's a flex in the center parts of the frame, because they're designed to actually move with the rocker that you put into it. So different flexes and things like that are okay, they're actually part of the process. But when you get down, 
you want to make sure that it's lined up. Again, you want to come along this side. With the clamp that I've set out, basically it's the same size clamp on either side of the rib for weight and balance. Um, so we'll give that a tentative line up, clamp it, do the other side, forwards and backwards, and then we'll reset that rocker, which we should have done before. It's all yours, Jenny. Okay, so Jono's put all the clamps on, so we'll call this a, a, a first clamp or a test clamp. Um, but what you can see when you look over the top of the board is it looks fairly flat. But when you come down and actually look down the spine of the board, you actually might see a few wiggles. So, uh, just lining up this one, probably a good one. Or just take the clamps off either side. I'm going to shift this across. Now what this is going to determine is the final outline shape of the board. So if this is over here, what we're going to do is get a bulge over here and a nice big flat spot over there. And we don't want that, we want that consistent curve. So the thing to do is to centralise it, is to look down the line and to reset everything. It doesn't matter if this takes you half an hour or an hour. The final outline shape is determined by how correct this centre line is. Okay, so Jono's just reset uh, all the clamps, lining it up through that centre line. And you really should be able to see how nice and tight that line is through there now. So that's going to help us to determine the, the proper outline shape. Now one of the things Jono asked is why the frame is flexing. And the frame is designed to flex because of the rocker. So anything like this, don't stress too much about it. When you're lining up the stringer, you're looking at crosshairs. Don't worry about these center spars. Really line up your crosshairs to be straight. And anything like this will be worked out at a later stage. It will be because there's either extra rocker or less rocker. Now Jono and I have had a chat about it and he wants to set the board up as a more traditional long board with the potential to uh, hang his toes on the nose. So next thing we're gonna do is reset that rocker um, for that sort of board. Okay, so like I say, we've just, just planted that center line. Everything's nice and straight, so we're gonna shift the rocker. Now one thing you might be able to see from there is that it's actually a little bit inverted through the tail. So I'm just gonna lift this up a bit and you'll actually see that, that in this front end, it's going to tip and actually create more nose rocker. But like I say, what John is after is more, more of a traditional nose rider. So we're going to take away this bit of timber here, and that'll really help to flatten it out. So what you'll see is that it is, it is nice and super flat the whole way through. There's a little bit of kick which will give a bit of sympathy through the nose, but if John is standing up here, it's not going to flip the tail out of the water. Um, really take your time with this, make sure it's okay. To me, there is a little bit of an inversion over here, so that rock is not quite correct. I don't want to lift the tail rocker up anymore, so I'm just going to slide this backwards. The rock is pretty good off the frame, um, but the, the whole process has been designed so you can customise your own board. And that's shape and rocker. Okay, so what we're going to do is glue it up. We're going to use the, the tech grip, so a polyurethane glue. You can again use your PVA glue. Um, I like this again, we can use it for the whole board, but it does expand and it will fill any gaps. Now because it does expand, you don't need a whole heap. The way I look at it is that it's, it's really the equivalent of a nice clean silicon bead. So we want to do all the internal, internal joins. Just take this one quickly and then it's all yours, Jono. 
so it might not look like there's a lot of glue there, but it is enough. Uh, we'll show you in the next video how that expands. And that's about it. Don't get it on your hands or your clothes. So basically finished day two, um, frames on the board, what do you reckon Johnny? Yeah I reckon it looks so sweet. <laughs> it's pretty epic. Absolute beast. It is a beast. So again there's a few little tweaks in the frame and then nothing to worry about. It's part of the design that, that I've designed into it is that these, these parts are able to flex um, and that allows individual rocker and stuff like that. So next time what we're going to do is put bracing in the board. So we're going to either use recycled foam from a surfboard or recycled packing foam. And basically try and keep it out of landfill and just strengthen the board. It's still going to be hollow, there's still going to be airflow, but we're just going to use that for bracing and longevity. Uh, that's the end of that. So we'll see you next time. Leave any comments if you've got any questions and stuff like that. Please don't expect me to get back to you. I'd rather be in the shed than on the computer. Um, but at some stage I will, maybe. Right, fun. Thanks, guys. Cool. Yep. See ya.